Alright guys, uh, welcome back to the Fire and Desert Part 2 with myself, Johnny and Patrick. How are you going? How's it going? Pretty good. Thanks All for having right. me back. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to Part 2 and I guess for the listeners who haven't heard Part 1, I'll just summarize quickly what we've talked last time. So we started off with Andrew Hawkins. There's this uh, a character, or this, sorry, this is a person in the UK who learns his ancestor was an English slave trader and he and a bunch of other people go on this uh, part, go on part of an expedition called Lifeline Expedition to go back through to Africa and to actually wear chains, wear like kind of stockades kind of stuff. And then they go to Africa in front of a stadium for other people, apologize in their languages, uh, apo sorry, apologize in their own language. And then they get the, I guess, the vice president of Ga Gambia to free them symbolically well, the, the guilt that they had from their ancestors, not necessarily what they've done, as in themselves, but what the ancestors have done, that guilt is free. And we, we sort of discuss, like, oh, it doesn't seem right. Like, this is, is emotional guilt. And, you know, can you be guilty really for something that your ancestor did, like, you know, centuries ago? And how do we keep moving forward? Like you, your, your kids, right? They'll learn about their ancestor and like, well, they'll, are they supposed to go back to like, you know, Gambia and that kind of thing? Or can you actually be guilty of something that's done ages ago? Can, you know, can you really be forgiven from that kind of guilt? Who should be forgiving those stuff? How can we reconcile? How do we move on? And we went into the book of the sunflower where we learned about Simon, who's the author, who is a Holocaust survivor. And we look in this little vignette where he gets taken away by... Uh, a nurse and he goes to see Carl who is a, a German SS soldier and Carl is dying he's bandaged up on his head he's received a wound he knows he's dying and he tells Simon his story about the war crimes he's, he's been involved so the massacres against the Jews I think there's one time where they actually you know put everyone into a house threw grenades set the house on fire shot any survivors all very horrible stuff and what Carl asked Simon is, Simon, as a Jew, can you forgive me for what I've done? Simon doesn't have any answer. He's, we don't know his emotions. I guess he's shaken. Um, he's shaken, taken back by the story. But he doesn't give forgiveness. He remains quiet and walks away. Fast forward a few years, the war has ended. He's still intrigued by Carl's story. So he actually goes back and see Carl's mom. Carl's mom, you know, talks to him and shares some of the stories about Carl. And she's still the, under the impression that Carl was a good, you know, boy. He was about to go to seminary, but then the Nazis, you know, their teachings took him away. And he died in battle somewhere fighting against the Russians. Nothing about the atrocities that he was involved with. And Simon listens and he walks away again. So he doesn't tell Carl the truth about what Carl was involved with. He doesn't reveal the story to her. So there's two these two incidences where he remained quiet. And then the book in part one ends with a question to his reader saying, what should I have done? And in part two, we actually go through, or part two of the book, we actually go through some of the reactions. So we've gone through... Uh, Jean Amory, the atheist response, which was, you know, I, you know, it, it has nothing to do with me, you know, as an atheist, I have, um, you know, there's two sides to this response. There's the, the philosophical one, which is, do you forgive someone or not? And then there's a political one where, as a nation, do you forgive someone or not for the, the historical grievances? And he said, you know, as an atheist, it has nothing to do with me. Uh, then it was one by uh, by Fox, um, who is a, a priest, and he says, "You know what, Simon is he's a, as a person after the war. He goes around hunting Nazis and bringing them to justice. You know, you know, his the way he's doing it now is because of this story, and he's trying to bring other people to face their own guilt, like Carl at the deathbed. So when these Nazis are brung, brought for justice and they're sentenced to death, they too can." You know realize that they've done something terribly wrong that was a so that was a catholic response well that was an observation that he made then there was one by a um yossi klein halevi he's a son of a holocaust survivor and he goes 
and he has this animosity towards you know Germans and as a journalist he goes to Germany to see the the fall of the Berlin Wall and this is supposed to be a joyous and uh, you know joy joyous moment you know the two sides the west and east uh, Germany are reconciled that the Berlin Wall has fallen and they all can be reconciled as a, as a country and unified and Halevi goes to one of the uh, German youths, you know, the, in the clubs, and he asks them, you know, what do you think about uh, the the Berlin Wall? And they like just stared him blank faced. And he goes, you know, you guys, you know, I get it. You guys feel guilty from World War Two about what happened to the Jews on the Holocaust, but this is a time where you can celebrate. And he he makes an observation that, you know, Germans have been so haunted by the devastation that the the ge next generation cannot have any you know emotion in celebrating a joyous moment that they're so haunted by the chains of guilt that they can't celebrate uh then we go to another person so jose hobde so he's a native american oh she's a native american and one of the things that he, she learned from her mother is that you know despite as a Native American sort of being driven into this reservation, you should always forgive because this hatred or whatever, this unreconciled moment between you and the other person is poison. It will poison your heart. And you know what? You should be more powerful than that. Don't let this poison eat into you. Don't let it hold you back. No, no harmful memory should have the power to hold, hold you down. And that's sort of where we left off because we uh, we ran out of time. So how have you been uh, enjoying this uh, part one so far? Oh, it was it was a honestly it was a fascinating conversation. I think it's a it, the issue we're exploring is both it's incredibly large and it's very complex as well. We're dealing with something that's very very complicated. From this part one, from the start where the examples are to all the uh, responses in part two of the book. You know, do you, do you find it valuable? Like, do you think it's something that we should be that's relevant for this time? Mm. I think it's I think it's incredibly relevant because it's getting to the heart, the human heart of what is a very complicated and complicated issue, and one that's um that's very volatile as well, mm -hmm. and very com and that can get and has become very combative between an us versus them sort of mentality and mindset. I think that the issues and the resp the responses in in the sunflower are very very interesting because you're being given you're being given a very again a very complex issue Nazis versus Jews um the ho Holocaust survivors versus Nazis and you're looking at various different pe different people's responses and I think that there's a lot of wisdom and insight to be gained from some of them you know, we're looking at it from all these other people, f different points of view on, on forgiveness, mm. people who are actually connected to the Holocaust, and some of yeah. them, um, we haven't covered them all, but like some of them actually say, yeah, no forgiveness for this guy. This guy doesn't deserve, Carl doesn't deserve it at all. He's he's treating, yeah. you know, Simon like a Jew again, like give me forgiveness because, you know, mm. you're part of that people. No, I, th I, th I think I think the, I think the comment made about... Um, the anger and the and the the need for revenge are uh, being like a poison in the, in the soul is i think that's a very, that's a very compelling idea towards this argument that it it does poison your soul um and it it doesn't allow restoration and healing um and forgiveness to go to come through on both on and this is and this is on both sides of of the field in this case but it's it's forgiveness and it's restoration on both for both people yeah both parties it's it's highly relevant um mm. i would say stuff like uh maybe the six-day war with israel and palestine and all the surrounding sort of arabic nations that you know we we have these people in the west bank and they're shelling each other and this war has been going on since uh i guess you know six-day war yeah uh you would have say china and japan and them you know japan coming in the rape of Nanking, you have all these atrocities, Unit 731. Mm. You know, to this day, it's 
it's uh, it's still uh, like a sore point yeah between these two nations and the the government of, of china or the people's republic of china is actually using it mm. to foster nationalism yeah yeah in the last 300 odd years as a race of people as human beings we have shown our capacity for great good and great evil in, e in equal measure and it's from that we're now seeing that there's a lot of there's a lot of hurt, a lot of damage, a lot of anger that's been caused by a lot of the evil. And we're seeing the results and the outcomes of that crystal clear today in some of the fractures observed in society, um, often di uh, divided down the line of either race or nationality. Yeah. All right. So I think we'll, we'll crack on with uh, yeah. the remaining two parts and then we'll go into some reflection and then we'll go into, say, why is it so important for Australians today? So the next bit is uh, from Dennis Prager. So you might have heard of him. He's a radio show, uh, radio show talk host, and he's also a religious Jew. He's written several books, and I, I guess you can find him on PragerU on YouTube. But here's his response, and he, here's, very, here's what I find interesting. So as noted, for 10 years, I've moderated a weekly radio show on which my guests were a Protestant minister, a Catholic priest, and a rabbi, different individuals each week. During that time, the notorious rape and beating of a woman jogger by a gang of young men in New York Central Park took place. After their arrest, a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church visited the boys at prison to tell them only one thing. God loves you. I was so furious that I publicly noted that someone ought to write an article how to get a personal visit from a cardinal. I thought of all the beautiful Catholics in New York devoting their lives to the poor and the sick who would give almost anything for a personal visit from a cardinal of the church. But the lucky recipients of such a visit, visit were sadistic batterers and rapists, who would have been murderers were, were not the wonders of modern medicine. They left the woman to bleed to death. On my show, I, I wondered aloud whether my fury at the cardinal, a good man, hence I omitted his name, was a personal or a Jewish response. I assumed the latter, since virtually all my Christian callers agreed with the Cardinal, and all my Jewish callers agreed with me. But I decided to test my thesis on the clergy. For four weeks, I asked the clergy what they would say to these torturers if they had met with them. Every Protestant and Catholic clergyman, liberal and conservative, essentially echoed the Cardinal's words. All the rabbis, reform, conservative and orthodox said they would not meet with the youths. If forced to, they would tell them of their disgust with them, that they should be severely punished and spend the rest of their lives seeking to redress the evil, and certainly would not tell them that God loved them. The Christian view of forgiveness and, as exemplified in the case of rapists, the Christian view of God's love. In a lifetime of Jewish study and teaching, I have never heard a Jew say that God loves an evil person have led to me to conclude that Christianity and Judaism, or perhaps only Christians and Jews, have differing views of evil and what to do about it. You know, he's a Jew and he's wondering in all these responses that the Christian view is very differing from the Jewish view, even though, you know, there's a popular idea that they both have the same, well, they have the same picture of God. I, I guess they do, mm. but the Christian has a, that further revelation in Jesus himself, but yeah, they've got similar roots. I, they they start from the same origin in that they are an Abrahamic they are Abrahamic religions, um, but there was a a split with obviously the teachings of Jesus, mm. and that's where we get where Christians get our New Testament, and there's a divergence, a split that then you have Orthodox Judaism, and then you have Christianity. Yeah. So uh, I guess one section that reveals is that I believe that there are four reasons the Christian doctrine of forgiveness has blunted Christian anger at those who oppress them. The notion that one should pray for one's enemies have been taken to mean pray for them, do not fight them. The belief that God loves everyone, no matter how evil, makes it impossible for a believing Christian to hate evil people and therefore difficult to fight them. I assume that those who love mass murderers are li less likely to want them dead than those who hate them and the Christian emphasis on saving souls for the afterlife has led to some de-emphasis on saving bodies in this life. So there's, there's a different mentality. Um, there's a different sort of 
Paul. So, you know, I guess one thing that annoys me is that it really shows a difference. And, you know, what drives one to forgive is part of the beliefs. Like for these Christians, it's no, no sin, no matter how bad is able to take you away from God. Yeah. Whereas in this perspective from the Jews, it's, it's, they don't deserve it. They uh, like, was it? They should be severely punished and spend the rest of their lives seeking to redress their evil. Yeah. The, how can someone, I guess, reconcile? I guess only through the death, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much, yeah. It's a conversation in and in of itself, delving into the differences between Christianity and Orthodox Judaism. But because Judaism doesn't have the revelation obviously the revelation of jesus the teachings of jesus as a core foundational principle the teaching that it's through jesus's sacrifice on the cross that you have forgiveness for your sins the jews don't have that so they they see this life as something that you need to continually to strive for to be essentially do the right thing to be good in the eyes of god and it's it's through, um, I'm pretty sure it's through, it's through, it's not only through a strict sacrifice system, but you've got the, you need to continue to continue to seek penance from God. For yeah. me, it's, um, you know, why do we talk about this Christian stuff? It's, well, we used to know how to reconcile, I guess, back in, I guess, before all this social media stuff sort of drowned everyone with their loud noises. Yeah. We've become a bit more secularized. I guess Australians are a bit more proud about that. You know, we're not really, really religious. Uh, we don't need to be part of those. Austra uh, Australia is not a Christian nation, well, as the, um, the yeah. catch cry would go. But And so we've lost some of those rules and etiquettes mm. on how to be nice, how, how, how to reconcile with each other, because mm. that is, a, I guess, a Christian value. Like, no person how bad is 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 still redeemable like okay mm -hmm. sure the justice system will take care of the sin but once that judgment well once that person goes through that pays the penalty in the justice system and goes to jail does his time yeah. and comes out re let's rehabilitate them into society and give them a second chance otherwise we end up going through this cycle again mm. yeah and uh, what hope has that person yeah this the idea of forgiveness and repentance you have you paid your penalty and now there's redemption for you afterwards so I'll go to the next bit and I'll probably end it there for the part two because the next one is a guy called Desmond Tutu who is from South Africa who was a son of a school teacher, domestic worker, part of uh, ordained to the priesthood and as you know much South Africa there is the apartheid right yeah. and he's one of the chairs for the South Africans truth and reconciliation commission to bring unity back to the people after that terrible time mm. one of his quotes that i found was very interesting was that he says it is clear that if we look only to retributive justice then we could just as well close up shop forgiveness is not some nebulous thing it is practical politics without forgiveness there is no future mm. and i think you know if we can't forgive and acknowledge the thing and acknowledge our right wrongs and forgive and get back together again like it's what he says there's you need it to that society function to have a, a better future otherwise you're still dragged back x many years ago and living in a mm. past so yeah that, that that is interesting because it takes the again a christian principle of of forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation those ideas and it almost pragmatizes them mm -hmm. it provides a um a secular reason for why these are good things to do yeah all right so that's just sort of the select pieces of an of the part two the responses by various mm. people and there's a theme that comes out from when you go through all these in full uh, and that is there is the notion of collective guilt you know the germans versus the jews there is a tension there obviously there is the justice that's there uh, that needs to be reconciled there's also you know for the jews there is a duty as a survivor to never forget the harm but there's also the questions of you know 
does Simon have the right to forgive Carl really on behalf of everyone? Like, well, he's not mm. the appointed person for for the collective. Mm. He wasn't really linked back unless maybe you can say it's a family of the person there. Mm. And does he have the right? Well, probably probably not. And that's some of the discussions I have in a mm. story. And then there's also, you know, was it right for Carl to ask Simon? Was that the appropriate mm. person? Well, well, I think that the fault that Carl made the fault that Carl made was that he looked at Simon as a Jew and then drew the conclusion that, oh, I will be able to receive vindication for what I've done by apologizing to a Jew. Mm. As opposed to, and again, he was on his deathbed, he wasn't in a position to do this, but I would probably have argued that if circumstances allowed, what would have been more appropriate is to seek forgiveness or apologize to relatives of the people that he had killed. And not, not just like a, a random person that's yeah, sort of, exactly. you know, just by the blood connect, connected to the thing, even though Simon himself was. Which is the, the core problem of where we've gotten to a lot of these racial hostilities and issues that we're dealing with today is that we looked at and felt, we looked at another human being and judged them by the color that, that they have a different skin color and then defined them as, oh, I am one race, you are another, that entitles me to commit this wrong against you. Mm. Then by seeking to apologize to, oh, another Jew or another person of this this other ethnic group, we're just perpetuating the same, in some ways we're, we're perpetuating the same idea. I found it very interesting that in the responses, Carl is sort of dehumanized. So in the story, like Simon actually records the story from from Carl, is that you know Carl after the the incident where he they killed a whole bunch of, well, I guess you can say murdered a whole bunch of of Jews, is that they they go drinking, they have to like sort of numb their emotions and pain because Carl even even though he's an SS person, he is human, right? He has feelings. He sees that this crime has actually affected him and his comrades. Mm. But in the responses by these people, it's like, you know, Carl's dehumanized. He is, he hasn't got a name, Carl. He just has SS man, Nazi, which is understandable from survivors. Yeah. But we just see the, the whole, it's clearly black and white. Well, you saw, uh, what was it? Um, The Marvel movie, uh, Black Panther. Uh, Have you seen that before? <laughs> I, I quote a lot of it. I, I've, I've read it from Wikipedia from the... Uh, the spoilers. <laughs> the same dehumanizing thing happens in that movie that I noticed. Whenever the Wakandans were referring to white people, any any white person, it was always a colonizer. Right. As a catch-all description for anyone who is white and not Wakandan was a colonizer. That's pretty dangerous territory over there. It's like a label which you can which you can assign all your emotions and attitudes towards. Yeah. And then you, and then. Not only that, just throwing it very liberally to any person that's not part of your community. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, it, it it was an interesting, I would call it a a story writing choice to to make to to use that as a description. It might even highlight either the attitudes of the writers or attitudes the the story that the writers wanted to express or explore in their story, even at this is an attitude that's created that's created a, that's been uh, fostered or developed in this culture hmm. again fictional culture obviously but again for the purposes of story writing for world building that's something that, that that's i think an intentional creative choice that was made because i i would argue i, I would certainly argue that if you went to let's take a, let's look at uh, the uk for example if you took the irish the scottish and the brits and said you are identical in every single form, in every single way because you are white they would look at you and laugh and they'd go no i'm scottish i'm irish i'm british i'm nothing like the other two mm -hmm. and i think that's because they're not defined by this we're not defined by our skin color we're defined by what our cultures have created we you could you have a wide diverse range of white cultures just in the same vein not all black cultures are the same. Well, I wouldn't even say I'm defined by my culture. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm not a black sheep of my family. And I would say I'm just defined by who I am. 
on yeah. my past actions, my decisions in life and what are choices I've made. So it goes, you can drill down even further, obviously, to cultures are made up of individuals and you can go even deeper. And I'm delving into a little bit of philosophy here at the moment. I think that's a way to go a little bit beyond the surface of race, of yeah. people divided by color of skin. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's a bit of a it's a bit of a weak way to divide people up. It's not a very good it's not a, an effective or a substantive way to understand the world if you just see color of skin. Mm-hmm. You would look at Chinese let's let's go to um, Asia for example, you'd look at Chinese and Japanese and say you are you have a yellow skin tone, so thus you are you're all one group of people. You're all identical. <laughs> even though they even though all hate each other. Well, nationally. <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's the same thing with the British, the Irish, and the Scottish, is that a couple hundred years ago, they were they hated each other's guts enough that they were warring with each other. Yeah. If you were to go over there and say, Hey, you're all white, that might that means you're all best of friends, they would have laughed at you. Mm-hmm. And probably run you through with a sword as well for daring to compare them to a filthy one of those. But yeah. Yeah. All right. So why do we talk about this? Why do we talk about this forgiveness stuff? And, you know, why is it applicable to young Australians? Well, I think in one area, the white elephant in the room is the the apology, the the issue that we have with Indigenous people. Yeah, we've been talk. We've always been talking about, I guess, global race relations. But he- here at home in Australia, we've got just just as many lingering issues within our society yep. that we're trying that we're wrestling to deal with. Right. So to get set the context for those outside uh, Australia, uh, we have a thing called a sol- stolen generation. So it's a, a policy given by the government between 1910 to 1960s or 70s of removing Indigenous children from their families under the authority of federal or state government and agencies uh, organizations ngos uh, churches would would do this under the act and and there was the belief that well we would take better care of these kids than the families and the side effects of this would be mental health issues among the kids alcohol and substance abuse and you know uh, it's it's a pretty i guess shaky pretty shocking policy yeah it's pretty damning at what at we can look again retrospect is a wonderful thing but we can look at the results of those policies uh now and we can go no this was a this was an awful idea mm. and and so when we had 2008 when when australia elected kevin rudd to be the prime minister you know there's this time and there was this time to apologize for that uh stolen generation the act now, that was 2008. It's now 2020. And we still have this sort of tension between the two groups. Yeah. And one of the things that sort of come out is uh, there's the whole change date. Change the date of Australia Day. Because yeah. Australia Day was, I guess, when the boats uh, sailed into, into the harbor. So that was when colonialism meets uh, indigenous people of Australia. And, yeah. what, and I think it's, you know, it's not Australia Day. It's Invasion Day. They're coming in yeah. and taking a boat places so that so that's a, a movement that's going on yeah uh i guess for for people outside australia if you go into our, our budget you'll notice that certain policies certain government programs would specify helping out indigenous indigenous people so we have their own educational system uh sorry in, in, uh, educational programs uh, health programs all that kind of stuff yeah and, and what I found interesting was there's also the acknowledgement as well. So that's sort of creeping in, I guess, recently. So it's just an observation. Like, I guess if you're a company, you would have like a induction day and the person who would leave it, it would always have like acknowledged the local people or local indigenous people of whatever, I, I guess, indig- indigenous um, territory that you would define it for you on yourself. And if you look into the map of, of indigenous culture, uh, indigenous, indigenous people is that it's 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 not just divided like in western australia the, the whole territories no there is like so many boundaries within there so within queensland there would be like a, a few <laughs> a few hundred uh, i'll need to check my facts on that one but yeah the, suffice to suffice say suffice to say there's a lot this is not just something that's just australia in fact canada with indigenous people there and also america and i've noticed well, I picked up this uh, video from Lindsay Shepard uh, where she was trying to address the issues 
of these mandatory acknowledgements. Mm. Who who was Lindsay Shepard by or who is Lindsay Shepard by the way? Uh, I th- she was like a, was a, I think she was going to like a master, a, a PhD student or doctoral student, okay. and, and she was outed by her university because she actually played a Jordan Peterson video, and it was just some discussing some of the, um, ideas that he had, and she as a tutor was trying to I guess instill some kind of you know let's look at both sides of the argument kind of thing let's look at something a little bit more uncomfortable but it's also grounded you know in truth and also pretty well articulated and she was dragged in front of university administration and then pretty much just booted out i think right okay yeah. then so bad bad she, she's guilty of a uh, bad thought uh, think speak <laughs> yeah uh that, that video is still ongoing i think she you can if you look her up Lindsay shepherd then there's a few interviews she gave with like dave rubin um uh, jordan peterson yeah oh, yeah uh, but I found it very interesting of her points, and that is, there's uh, what she's observed is that you know in these people who are giving acknowledgement, it's it's not really doing anything. So the thing that they feel is like they feel a bit smug about it, right? Like, oh, how's my acknowledgement to these people? Uh, they don't really want to transition the land back to the indigenous people. Like, of course yeah. not. But it gives them a sort of emotional sort of well being look how good of a person i am for doing this yeah they're not really supporting the mental health the alcohol abuse or substance abuse or not uh improving their educational opportunities at all so they're not really doing it they're just sort of giving lip service yeah from 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 the clip that she showed at the start of her video that kind of keyed teed off the entire her entire um, argument (laughs) well so that was was an example that she gave (laughs) yeah yeah, you well, you watch you watch the video and you realize when when this guy is standing up to speak at the university, he's he's there for himself. He's not there to help Indigenous Canadians. Yep. He's there to to promote. Look how good, how look how virtuous a person I am. Yeah. There's a term called virtue signaling. I think it's quite it's quite applicable here. Yeah. Very applicable. Like there's only like only the white people. Or the, the colonialists are well. The white people are therefore identified themselves as guests, occupiers, and settlers. Yes. Right. And like, it doesn't matter whether you just got off the airplane, you know, yesterday. Like, you're part of that collective. <laughs> yeah. As an Australian, if I go there, it's like I'm a guest. I'm well. In in some respects, I am a guest because I'm Australian. I'm not Canadian. But mm. um, it's like I would be called settler or occupier. It's like so. I, I didn't occupy anything. Mm-hmm. I don't want to settle here either. So, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The other part is uh, indigenous people are perceived as a sole group that are environmentalists or caretakers of the land. Mm. So, I, I know I recycle. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I do myself. I'm also concerned about the environment, right? Yeah. I mean, not necessarily the whole uh, 2019 mm. climate change fiasco yeah. where I go to extremes of banning everything, but it's like, you know, I still care about, you know, sustainable, clean energy. I don't want to breathe in smoke. Yeah, but well, essentially, essentially respect, respecting and caring for the land that we live in. Because I, I think I think there are some good arguments to be had for, obviously, taking care of the land. Um, yeah. Because it's what we live on. It sustains us. If it um, gets tarnished or destroyed or broken beyond repair, we can't grow food on it, for example. We can't drink its water. Hmm. But the issue, th- yeah, the issue here though is that only indigenous people are the good environmentalists. You know, you white people, you're the occupiers, you're the settlers, you're polluting everything. Mm. Yeah. Uh, never mind that you know the indigenous, well, some indigenous indigenous people would would benefit from some of the health programs that we've installed, um, the transport, the cars. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But again, it's it's the good with the bad. Is that. Um, our is that our collective and our, I look at it as our human impact on the planet over the last three hundred to four hundred years. Um, there's been a phenomenal amount of good that's been made, and I think there's a fair argument, a fair case to be made for that. Mm-hmm. In the and, and at the same token, there has been a phenomenal amount of evil and um, harm and hurt that's been caused as well. Yeah. Um, I don't and I don't think it's a there's more or less of one or the other. I think I think it comes down to e- that. Both of them are should be looked at equally, and that way we can then start to address some yeah. of these problems. Yeah, uh, you you take you stole one of my points. It's like 
you know, there, there's a sense of, <laughs> I'll just say right now is that, you know, I think this movement is not asking for equality. It's saying that, no, 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 this group, even though we, we think of ourselves as all equal, this group is slightly better. You know, it's the whole, mm. I guess, intersectionality that if you're a white person, you're equal value, but you know, you got this historical evil past mm. behind you. You sort of implicit, you know, unconsciously oppressing other people. So the question is, are you equal or is it better? And I think mm. there's a definitely a narrative that says, you know, if you're an indigenous person, you are the better side. Mm. Of the argument, yeah. Of, of I guess, collective. <laughs> you raise a very interesting point in when you look at someone who is an indigenous Australian and you say you are, often there's two words that are used uh, that are described. One is traditional owner and one is custodian. Mm-hmm. I think the idea of traditional owner is i don't think it's an it's the best way to describe i don't think at least i think that custodian is i think that there's actually some value and some some well-intended meaning behind that because before captain cook arrived brought english settlers or english convicts really to australia there were thriving um, indigenous cultures living in a, a different way than the british but they were living in a way that nurtured and cared for the land and allowed it to sustain they were um, hunter gatherers. They traveled from region to region, and one of the one principle I remember learning from primary school was one thing they did was that they would they would hunt in one one region or one area for a time, then they would pack up and move and allow then the land to heal and recover and regrow, and allow animals to come back and continue to thrive, and then they would come back after a period of time the next season and hunt again, and you would have this cycle going on and on and on. I think that the, a lot of the lessons can, there's a lot of valuable lessons that can be learnt from our Indigenous Australian community because they can, we can learn from them about here are effective ways to farm or take care of the land to allow it to prosper. So the idea of custodianship is, I think, an, is, a, is an appropriate one to um, be used here. Well, you've raised a point because like Indigenous people practice bush burning to control all the dead foliage and to prevent further fires and what just happened this year we had the biggest bushfire in australia yep and we'll need to dig a little bit deep into it but there's some things about extreme conservationism where we can't touch anything we can't burn anything yeah that that allowed the the dead leaves to grow so and yes exactly mm, I, I need to look a bit more into that one yeah i think the most recent bush for bushfires are too recent to be and we don't know enough to identify what where the blame was or who what was actually caused by who but the principle the idea still remains that there are practices that um, have been passed down generation to generation within the indigenous australian communities that are just uh, as they are incredible are incredibly significant and valuable today if you want to dub it indigenous australian culture versus white culture if there are if you want to divide it down that line there are very good things to be found on both. You were talking before about um, transportation and healthcare, for example, technology that we've been able to create and, pro- and we're able to share and provide across all the different communities living um, in Australia, regardless of color of skin or race. And I think that they're just on, the, on exactly the same vein. In the Indigenous Australian community, there are a lot of incredibly valuable cultural things that have been developed and passed down and maintained that we can share and learn. Yeah. Well, there's so much more we can do rather than just giving lip service. And, and I think Lindsay Shepard says, like, there's nothing wrong with these acknowledgements, but when you make it mandatory, you make it, you cause guilt in these people. Like, you cause guilt in, like, especially, like, white students. She always made quite a decent argument talking about when the government steps in or the university administration steps in and demands that this is a thing that must happen, that's, it's a stifling, stifling free speech. Well, I mean, like, just don't make it mandatory. Like, if you want to say it, say it. If you want to say it, say it. But also, if you do say it, mean it as well. The video that she played at the start um, of her um, of her piece with the guy, university student, giving the um, acknowledgement, I would be very suspicious of his goodwill and intent with the acknowledgement that he was um, he was giving. Yeah. I mean, you know what? Actions speak loud on words. So go help out on one of those programs. Go out. Yeah. Saying, you know, Northern Territory, 
and just helping the people out there. I think further to add to that, and again, I don't know, I don't know anyone who is um, a um, Indigenous Canadian, but it would, I think, it would be really worth asking the question or learning from the at least the Canadian context whether they think that having that acknowledgement given to them is a beneficial thing. We're talking about um, healing, forgiveness, restoration, um, redemption. It's a worthwhile question asking, are these things that are helping to repair some of the hurt and the harm that's been caused in the past, is it building that bridge again? If it is, then I would say, hey, okay, this is a good thing to continue to do because it's built, it's rebuilding the bridge. If it's not, then I think we need to take a step back and go, okay, if this isn't fixing the problem, what what do we need to do to fix the problem? And but, but also, does it induce guilt on the other side? That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think you're then dealing with this perpetual cycle of if you refer to yourself as colonizer, and that's the mentality that you adopt and you start to teach that to your children and the, and the next upcoming generation, and that's how you see yourself, unfortunately, we're going to see that, I would say that we are going to turn into what we what we were talking before about Germany, where the German people were were broken, were, were completely shattered. So even when they have this, when they gain their liberty and their freedom again, when the Berlin Wall comes down, they can't feel anything. Yeah. Because they've, they've lost their, their self-respect and their pride as a culture, as a people, as individuals even. Yeah. If you continue to go down that road of, ref- of seeing yourself as, as a colonizer, or as a settler, or as an invader, what sort of mentality are you going to instill in um, in in that group of people? Mm. I would certainly say that nothing good can come from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's not like we can quick press a reset button and just give back the land and everything, because you know the the, the people here have also, or well, these colonizers, they have a history too. And then like it's like I guess Rhodesia, when in the Rhodesian War, it's like. They have to defend their places. Like, where else would they go after they get evicted? Because they have family roots too. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's not easy. The the give the land back campaign, I think, has a lot of logical flaws and fallacies within it. Because who do we give the land back to? By the very nature of Indigenous Australian communities, is that they were hunter gatherers, they were nomadic, traveling from region to region. Yes, we have a modern day map that we've kind of determined okay this area of land belongs to this group of people but that land was most uh, in the span of uh, how how i can't remember is it is it 66 million years that's often cited as um how old i don't know i don't know um i'm not sure i've i I admittedly i have forgotten but let let's for sake of argument let's say a million years obviously um i i'm pretty pretty sure it's cited uh, sorry it is cited as more but for sake of argument say it's a million that region of territory, I can guarantee you, did not belong to that group of people for a million years. Well, they would have like tribal conflicts as well, right? Yeah, the tribal conflicts, because again, not all, just because you share this color of skin does not mean that you're going to get on with every single person who shares the same skin color. You're going to have conflicts between different groups, disagreements, often wars, and those boundaries would have been shifting and changing back and forth based off whoever had this better technology, whoever had the sharp, the bigger rock, the sharper spear, tactics, so maybe. on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which unfortunately does go to that. That is why British were able to, um, when, when they arrived, they were able to enforce what they wanted because they, they had better technology than the indigenous Australians. Unfortunately, that's a, that that is just a cold hard fact. Um, mm. There's no getting, no real getting around that. When you have human conflicts, again, regardless of race, go go with culture. What is often a defining factor is who has better technology. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, mm. One point I think is the whole learning to love the enemy thing. So yeah, after World War Two, uh, you had Germany and you had Japan you had broken economy. And there's a thing called the Marshall Plan, which the Allies created because they actually want to rebuild that economy. Because the next, I guess, the next enemy was uh, Russia in the in the whole Cold War thing with the USSR. But instead of perpetu- but because of the Marshall Plan, by putting in funds, re- reinforce uh, infrastructure for Germany and Japan, 
they actually created one of the strongest allies uh, with those countries, right? So the, the U.S. has bases in Germany and Japan. They have a very strong economy. They're, they're on the same side. But it actually stopped the hatred from going from World War One to World War Two. So we had a Treaty of Versailles in World War One, And the Germans had the, the raw deal, repatriations, all that kind of stuff. And that led to World War Two, right? Because of frustrations of the economy and then led to, I guess, further hatred in the Nazi party and Hitler rising. And you had World War Two. But rather than punishing them after World War Two and possibly creating World War Three, is that they've helped, they've embraced their enemies and said, let's learn to love them. Let's invest in these countries. Let's make them our, on our side. I think that's something we can learn rather than just perpetuating the next generation of hatred. Well, I guess the call to action, I think reading the book, reading The Sunflower, I actually enjoyed reading it. Uh, it wasn't, it's not, it's not very thick. Um, it took me about maybe a week or so just to go through it. So uh, look it up there. Simon Weinzerthal, The Sunflower on the possibilities of, and limits of forgiveness. I think one thing is not letting old grievances rot your heart. So what Jose Hobde, uh, the Native American, not letting it poison your heart. Uh, forgiving is one way to not let it chain you back. Right. I guess not being guilted is another thing. So knowing your ancestor did something, I think you still got to respect that there's still a difference between you and them. There, You have the autonomy. You have the chance to improve yourself, but you weren't, this guilt by association thing tears people down. And then understanding how it affects the world around us that, I mean, I guess we go back to the intro story of, of Andrew Hawkins and trying to seek forgiveness by, I guess, going back to Africa is a very strange idea, but, and, and I guess is it appropriate for him to travel all the way and pray in chains and seek forgiveness? I think this is sort of a, this mentality is in Australia that we sort of I guess white Australians do beat themselves up a fair bit on, on this issue, with, especially against with with the whole indigenous um, uh, tension there. So, yeah. Oh, what do you think, Pat? I think when Kevin Rudd offered that apology for the stolen generation, I think that that should have been a moment where, as Australians, could have come together again. Unfortunately, it was a missed opportunity because I think that it was used more for political points, which again goes back to these false platitudes, efforts, these self-aggrandizing moments, virtue signaling. It, I think, that needs to come from a genuine desire to seek to solve tangible, real problems, whether these are uh, practical or physical problems or emotional um, and spiritual problems as well. We're tackling with reconciliation, which at its heart is an, is an emotional response. So we need to be able to deal with that. And that's, that's why I said earlier that we need to accept and offer forgiveness in equal measure. But there needs to be the, that reconciliation then follows after that. If we don't have that, we're going to be stuck in this perpetual cycle. Just a point of clarification, Lindsay Shepard was a master's student who graduated from Wilfrid Laurier University. You'll find her channel on YouTube. You know, I enjoy putting this podcast together. I think our cultural attitude has changed with increasing secularization. We used to know how to forgive and reconcile, especially as children. But as we move towards a postmodern age where we claim to be free from religion, we become tangled with the chains of historical guilt. Saying sorry doesn't seem to be enough, and we feel we must self-flagellate ourselves to rid us of guilt, shame and pain. And it seems to be the case in Australia. As we march past a decade since the apology, we feel nothing else will make up for our sins except to self-annihilate ourselves, our history and our identity. I wonder what strange means for turning for our sins will Australians do in the future to make up for the past. Will we end up like Andrew Hawkins? 
who feels the need to walk through the streets of Africa in chains. Will we end up kissing the boots and humiliate ourselves publicly like the white couple in America to turn for the collective guilt of American slavery? Perhaps Friedrich Nietzsche put it best when he realised the ramifications of such secularization. He wrote, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatest of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become God simply to appear worthy of it? As much as Australians love to scoff at religion, it does play a hold in our culture. I'm not advocating a return to medieval Christendom. Things that we knew clearly yesterday on reconciliation seem to have been forgotten today. So what sacred games must we invent to replace reconciliation? How long does a generation need to be held hostage by its predecessors as with the young Germans feeling empty towards the joyous moment when the Berlin Wall fell. If you'd like to support our mission to produce quality podcasts like this, please share and subscribe. Place a link on your social media for your friends. Every bit of support counts. If you want to reach us, you can email us at thefireinthedesert at gmail.com or use Twitter at fireinthedesert. Music is Out Fox in the Fox by Ken McLeod at incontech.com. And thank you for listening to Fire and Desert. We'll see you guys next time.